get started. I'm Flynn. Hi. And I'm Mike. And welcome to Live with Gateway API 1.2. Not really. Or 1.1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. <laughs> um, I'm a tech evangelist for Linkerd. Uh, I don't actually remember your title right now. Yeah. I, I'm a senior product manager uh, at Microsoft working on upstream open source things, uh, like Istio, Istio, Gateway API, and multi-cluster stuff as well. We are also the co -chair, two of the chairs for the Gamma initiative within Gateway API, bringing Gateway API to Service Mesh, which is the reason why we're doing this talk yeah. about messing with Service Mesh. We've done this talk before at KubeCon in Paris. We've if you saw that one, it. we've added a little bit, but we still won't be offended if you decide to leave, because it is a 90-minute <laughs> workshop. But we would love it if you stayed anyway. Um, there's a little bit of an interesting thing going on here in that when we did this in Paris, we had two HDMI cables and they could switch the video from laptop to laptop because my laptop is set up to run this with Linkerd and Envoy Gateway. And, and I'll be running through the same uh, APIs, same CRDs that we're applying to the cluster, but with Istio. So we're doing, with one exception, we're doing exactly the same configuration and two wildly different sets of infrastructure. We will tell you what the one exception is when we get to it. It's a fairly minor exception. Um, for this laptop, or this workshop, <laughs> we have one cable. So there's gonna be a certain amount of unplugging and replugging laptops. We will Just try to keep that to a minimum. Us, yeah. <laughs> we'll try to keep that to a minimum because every time we do it, it always has the potential to crash something. So All right. it's possible that we'll get to a point and just go, you know what, we're going to show this with just one infrastructure as we go. Oh, and the 1.2 versus 1.1.1 thing, we will also talk about a little bit. But the short version is that um, Linkerd cannot yet use Gateway API 1.2 for very technical reasons. Yeah. That we're it. working on fixing both upstream and, and within Linkerd. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Onward. All right, well, let's get started. So who is this for? Uh, this talk is for platform engineers building infrastructure for multiple application teams. Uh, it's for application developers who want resiliency and safety with blue-green or canary deploys and related functionality, uh, or anyone interested in growing their skills by learning a single API which can be used to configure dozens of different products. Uh, the two that we're demonstrating here today are just two of I think over two dozen, at least, by now, gateway API implementations. I think we're up to about 30. Yeah, we're actually doing good. three here, because Envoy Gateway and Linkerd oh, yeah, are yeah. not we're, the same we're thing. Third, yeah. So not only are we showing two different service meshes, but we are also, in Linkerd's case, bringing in another thing to be the ingress controller. Yeah. So yeah, um, API. one of the great things with uh, gateway API is that like, instead of needing to learn a bespoke set of CRDs and familiarity with every different product that you may be asked to work with, learning this one API will be a more broadly applicable skill set similar to learning Kubernetes. Um, you learn the some plan. of the constructs there, and you can apply them to many different uh, use cases and needs. So what's on the agenda today? What are we going to cover? Uh, we'll start with a brief description of the ingress problem and how Gateway API relates to that, kind of like the background and where did this come from? Why does this API exist? Uh, we'll go through a brief description of service meshes and why Gateway API is relevant there, too. Uh, and then we'll go through a workshop. We'll uh, walk through some sample... Uh, I guess, We're actually going to show yeah. configuring an application and setting up an application on a cluster and configuring everything using Gateway API and watching it break and... Well, okay, we're going to watch it break and then hope we can fix it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. Co I've, common tasks that you would use to Gateway API to accomplish. Yep. Now is a good time to start praying to the demo goddesses, just you know, for reference. So yeah, what are you going to need for this? You're going to need a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we're using K3D for this demo, but any cluster should work. Uh, to follow along, you'll need kubectl, helm, bat, and if you want it, yq, just for viewing YAML in a slightly uh, more pleasant way. And we'll be downloading Linkerd and Istio Cuddle during this tutorial itself. Yes. And the link there, uh, we'll post the slides afterwards, but if you want to check out the source of the workshop, uh, it's github.com, buoyant.io, slash gateway-api-workshop. 
the code that is in that repo that Mike just mentioned is what we are going to be doing live on stage, as in we just pushed up the last changes before walking over here. <laughs> so that's literally it the was stuff. a four line gift to the read me. It's not that bad. I mean, before <laughs> that. <you know? laughs> Uh, and yeah, also just a word of caution is make sure you're using an empty cluster. Please. Um, we do not want to be responsible for you breaking your production installation of Istio or Linkerd. <laughs> yes. And if you are doing this on a production cluster, you will break your existing <laughs> installation. Let's be clear. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the ingress so, problem. Yeah, the ingress problem is the thing that Gateway API was originally intended to solve. If you have a user and you have a cluster and you have things running inside the cluster, then the user is going to want to use the things in your cluster, and this is not a thing that clusters allow on their own. This is specifically a thing that clusters are intentionally going to prevent. So we need something to sit in between the user and the workloads that can go mediate access from outside to inside safely under the control of the people, you know, the application developers or the platform teams, depending on how you set things up. Um, it's an important problem because it's the first problem that everybody developing in cloud native runs into. There is no way to use cloud native to solve problems without also solving the ingress problem. So Gateway API was going after that particular problem, trying to come up with a way that you could solve this problem and still have that knowledge be portable if you changed infrastructure. Because the older ingress resource, from experience, what we found was that the ingress resource itself was not terribly expressive. And so it tended to have people pile extra functionality into it just by saying, oh, you can add this annotation. Oh, you can add this annotation each of which was specific to a particular technology, none of which were portable between technologies. Something that started as like a relatively small, narrow scope thing is usable in small, narrowly scoped circumstances. Exactly. But when you try to do more with it, it didn't really work that well. <laughs> yeah, and one of the really entertaining things about the Ingress problem is that small and narrowly scoped is the opposite of the reality of the Ingress problem. We also found, I mentioned it was too limited, I kind of skipped over the monolithic bit because, um, because we were talking about annotations for a moment. But the monolithic thing is actually a problem that we sort of figured out a little bit later, which is that there are multiple different roles operating within the same Kubernetes cluster. In really small organizations, it may be one person fulfilling all the roles, but as you get larger, you end up with different people. So you'll have one person maybe whose job it is to worry about the hardware running the cluster. You'll have one person whose job is to worry about setting up the things that affect the entire cluster. And then you'll have the application developers who are focusing in on a particular application rather than the whole cluster itself. And what we found was that the ingress resource crams things together that are really the purview of two different roles. And so you end up with this collision where the application developers and the platform engineers are both trying to edit the same resource at the same time, which does not go well. Or even multiple application teams. Or it's multiple application too teams. too easy yeah. to accidentally break another team's configuration. Right. And it's conversely extremely difficult not to break anybody else's configuration. Uh, it's also impossible to do things like use RBAC to limit what the application developers can do without also limiting the cluster, provider, cluster engineers. Um, and we also mentioned poor extensibility. You can't, the way Ingress grew up, it was really difficult to go through and add new things to it in a reasonably structured way, so people gave up trying. So even for like functionality that may be speci specific to a particular implementation, with Gateway API, we still wanted to make sure there was a common pattern and framework for doing that kind of stuff. Yep. So, Which leads us to Gateway API. Yes, introducing Gateway API. Uh, you may have heard about it by now. It's um, a new API for ingress traffic management. And, and more. <laughs> and more, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that, that's where it started. That's not where it's ending. Uh, so yeah, Gateway API is a project within Kubernetes SIG network. It's started in 2020 as Ingress V2. Um, Conceptually. 
Uh, for various reasons, it um, had a scope that ended up growing beyond that, and that name felt limiting uh, <laughs> in, in other ways, both, both tactical and in terms of what we wanted to do with it. There are actually a lot of really good reasons not to call it <laughs> yes. ingress v2 in practice. Uh, yeah, it's primarily focused on tackling the annotations wild west of the ingress resource. Uh, and some of this, uh, I'll get into the personas in a minute. But uh, <laughs> we, we reached GA with a 1.0 release in October 2023. So uh, it has been GA for uh, over a year now. Yeah. So it's very much something that you can use today. And it's actively developed. And we're continuing to add more to it. And people do use it today for the record. Yeah. So um, if you look at the diagram on my right, um, you'll see some of the different personas that we we're talking about. When we we're talking about the different roles of who would be using uh, this functionality for ingress or other such needs, uh, you have the infrastructure providers. Is Sometimes that's a cloud offering a managed experience. Sometimes it's someone installing Kubernetes on bare metal hardware in your data center. Uh, but that's a different role than kind of the cluster operators oh, who may be doing. Are HDMI cable? <laughs> we're getting another HDMI cable. This is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, so uh, the, and the cluster operators are who are doing your day to day Kubernetes administration. They care about things like RBAC, they care about things like exposing the actual gateway resource to the public internet and mediating that in a way that's going to work for. The app, dev, the app dev teams. The cluster operator is often, uh, in larger organizations, it can be a like platform engineering team, where they're providing the cluster as a shared resource to many different app dev teams. And then your application developers are primarily focused on uh, their uh, applications. Um, they don't want to have to care all that much about the infrastructure that's running underneath them. They just want it to work. They may have specific needs for application management, like uh, being able to shift traffic for doing new deploys of new versions of their applications uh, or other such things. They want resiliency. They want to make sure that they're able to fail over traffic as needed. Um, but they're really concerned with their application code and making sure their business logic uh, is the thing that they're focused on. If you go look up the definitions of these roles on the Gateway API page, uh, you will find specifically that the application developers are described as people who are very, very busy and don't really care about Kubernetes all that much. Yeah. They are a very interesting class of, cl class of people to work with because almost everything we do in Gateway API or otherwise is friction to them while they are trying to solve business problems. Yeah. This makes life really challenging sometimes, and this is a thing that we try to pay attention to. Um, Another thing worth pointing out, as we said earlier, if you're a four-person startup, these are probably all the same person. Absolutely. I, I've been at that startup. <laughs> <laughs> I, so have I. I have been in all three of these roles on the same day or in the same hour, right? Yep. If you're Microsoft, you, know, <laughs> you probably have entirely separate teams of people in each of these roles. Um, it's also or, worth or noting. Or many of our customers. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. It's also worth noting that so for example, Mike does work with Microsoft. In some of their customer organizations, then you'll find that the, app, the infrastructure provider up at the top of that graph will be Mike. It, it could be a different his, company, yeah. Or his team, we, we whereas have, the cluster operator will be somebody who works for the customer's organization, yep. as do the app devs. So these, these roles may or may not even be within the same company. In some cases, roles will be filled by automated processes even. But there's a lot of different ways in which the roles get filled. But all three of these roles are filled all the time is the interesting thing there. So moving along, uh, Gateway API is, has a standard generic API for common functionality. And this is really like a core emphasis of this API is that whereas Ingress v1 set out to be a small, narrow scope and was relatively fixed after that, uh, with kind of you're left to your own devices if you need to do more than that. Mm -hmm. Gateway API has been actively engaging all of the implementations of it. We encourage them to come to the SIG, uh, to come to the weekly meetings, to contribute, to show us what you're doing with it, so that if we have three or four implementations that are trying to accomplish the same task and have even sometimes come up with similar implementations on their own, we actively want that to become upstream. We want to move that into the core API 
and we have a path to do this in a way yeah. through core extended and implementation specific functionality so that it's a big tent uh, for all these implementations to be able to fit within this and mm -hmm. share the functionality that makes sense to share. And of course, those discussions at those meetings are never, ever contentious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so should I start using Gateway API now? It's an easier question now than it was last year. It's been GA for a year. The answer is still pretty much the same, but it is easier. Yeah. Um, so if you have a new ingress or service mesh deployment, I've talked to a lot of folks here today, a surprising number that are mm -hmm. still at day zero. They're, I'm looking at service mesh. Is this right for me? If that's where you're starting out, consider starting with Gateway API. Yeah. It's something that if you are not in a position where you have a legacy infrastructure that has specific complex advanced capabilities and you need really all of the twists and knobs in, <laughs> in Envoy or whatever <laughs> your implementation may be, if you're just starting out and you need MTLS and maybe some like traffic routing, then yeah, you should absolutely look at these Gateway API implementations to start. Some traffic routing can be pretty advanced while we're yes, at it. Yes, yes, and, and um, we're, we're gonna get into yeah. that and show that, so. But there are, there are a lot of places where, actually, you know what, never mind. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting, about to stomp on my Sure. Case. Go um, ahead, sorry. But yeah, if you have an existing stable deployment, uh, if you have a mesh or ingress solution that's already working for you today, start learning these concepts. Uh, we're actively developing Gateway API. We know that there are some gaps, and that's mm -hmm. stuff that we're working on for the future. Um, and it's, it's coming together. We've already had more stuff land this time since uh, last time that we talked in Paris. So it, it's exciting to see this stuff continue to evolve. And yeah, it's, it's the most collaborative API in Kubernetes history. So please, whether you're an implementation looking for Gateway API or you're an end user, we absolutely want more end users to tell us what you're trying to do with Gateway API. Is it working for you? Are there, are there issues or friction you have adopting it? Where and make sure that we're solving your you? use cases. Actually, especially if you're an end user, please drop by and let us know what's, yeah. what you think. Um, this is a, an area of particularly active development there of how do we make sure that Gateway API is doing its job for application developers or you know, for each of these roles rather than focusing in on just one or two of them. So traffic management in the before times, you had to learn specific ingress or route or whatever uh, options for every possible implementation uh, that you would be working with. <laughs> and with Gateway API, hopefully we're making that a bit simpler. You learn one API and you can use it with numerous products. As we're gonna show. So what, what can we do with API? A, a bunch of things. Um, Gateway API was designed to tackle the ingress problem. You actually have to do a lot of different things to tackle that really well. So in addition to just really dirt simple things like, oh, traffic shows up on this particular path and it goes to this service, there's a lot of other stuff that people have come to treat as table stakes in the Ingress controller world, in the API gateway world, as opposed to gateway API world. Um, one of them is traffic splitting. That's uh, one of the things that's really common and that we're going to show today. The simple one up here right now is you know, a canary sort of thing where, oh, I wanna take 1% of the traffic going to Foo and route it over to the new version of Foo so I can find out if it's working. And then after a little while, you do 10%, and then you do 15%, and at the end of it, you say, okay, this is great. Um, the, there's another one below that for in the multi-cluster world, you may very well have a service mirrored from one cluster into another, another cluster, and it picks up a unique name so you can use a gateway API route to take traffic to the new name and route it through to the old name or the old name and route it through to the new name in another cluster. Lots and lots of interesting things you can do here for multi-cluster and failover and all this stuff. And one of the important things about this too is that you can do this without changing your application code. Yes. This is something that you can do by applying a CRD to the cluster, your gateway is going to pick it up and it's going to shift the traffic over while right. your application is still running. That's arguably one of the extremely important things. If your application thinks it wants to talk to HTTP colon slash slash foo, being able to control where that goes without having to change what your application talks to opens a lot of doors. Next up. Dynamic we really probably though. should have put these a little bit 
in the other order, maybe. Um, <laughs> dynamic request routing opens doors for things like A-B testing, where if a request arrives for foo and it has a particular header to indicate that it's a test user, route it to the new version. If it doesn't have that header, keep routing it to the old version. This permits you not to just do random sampling for traffic shifting, but it lets you do traffic shifting based on the characteristics of the traffic. And this, again, opens lots and lots of doors to interesting things. I'd like to point out that last note there, but not the body. Gateway API is not meant to be messing with looking into the body of a request really ever. Yeah. Um, this is currently causing a lot of problems with LLMs. If you work for OpenAPI, please come talk to me. Um, <laughs> progressive delivery we mentioned. I want to call out progressive delivery and A-B testing there anywhere in the call graph. The API gateways have been able to do this sort of thing for a very long time, but an API gateway can only do these right at the edge of the call graph where your traffic is coming into the cluster in the first place. Traffic happening deep in the cluster does not go back through the API gateway if you're doing it right. But with gateway API and a service mesh, you can do dynamic request routing anywhere in the call graph. So if you're four layers down and you want to do an A-B test, go for it. It'll work. And um, your user doesn't even have to see it. Your, <laughs> your user probably won't know about it, Yeah, hopefully. Um, per user canaries is a particular example of that where you can, we're actually going to show that one where yep. we have a, a way in our demo app where you can put in a username and then we'll go and pick which, which of the various backends it goes to. Yep. So that's some cool stuff. Um, all of the things that I've been talking about so far, I have used HTTP as an example, mostly because I'm used to saying HTTP a lot. <laughs> Pretty much everything I just described works for gRPC as well. This is a new thing since we did this in Paris. Yeah. gRPC route became it's standard. Now standard as of yeah. Gateway API 1.2. Right. Or no, 1.1, 1 .1, right? Um, recently. I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, oh, One okay. of the entertaining things with Gateway API is that cha things change fairly quickly. Um, at any rate, recently, it became possible to use gRPC routing and do all of these things with it as well, just like we do with HTTP route. The reason that we have a separate route type for gRPC is that there's a bunch of stuff with gRPC that's a little bit different, and it makes the experience better for the end user if we have a specific route. So for example, where HTTP routes, you can do matching on the path. gRPC routes, we have a way to match on the gRPC service and method. And we'll, we'll know, walk through examples. We're of gonna that walk through examples bit. of that, but it ends up being nice. Um, oh, yeah. See, it says right there on the slide, gRPC <laughs> yep, route went GA <laughs> in Gateway API version 1.1.0. Since I wrote this slide, I get to believe that, but maybe we should double check just to be sure. Um, important note, 1.1.0 itself had a bug in gRPC route. The status of gRPC route was not marked as a sub-resource. Uh, if you are wanting to use 1.1 instead of 1.2, please use version 1.1.1. That is why we are using 1.1.1. Your, your, your implementations will thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Demo architecture. This is our demo. This is the world famous phases demo. Um, this is the sort of thing that we will see when we first install it and first start running it because phases is designed to be deliberately terrible. It's supposed to show you a bunch of grinning faces on blue backgrounds, and it will not do that when we turn it on because lots of things will be failing. This is the point, do not panic. Um, we have a cluster. Outside the cluster, we have a web browser. In the browser, we're running the faces GUI. The faces GUI you saw is a grid of cells. For each cell, the GUI will call a workload in our cluster called face. The face workload will call smiley and color. The smiley workload is supposed to return the grinning smiley. The color workload is supposed to return the color blue. The face workload composites those two together and then hands them back to the GUI so that the GUI can display it for you. Um, interesting note, face uses HTTP to talk to smiley, but it uses gRPC to talk to color, just so we can show off gRPC routing, basically. Um, we also have in the cluster a smiley2 workload that has a hard-eyed smiley and a color2 workload that returns the color green. We're not using those at the beginning but we will use them as the demo progressives. Um, I am not gonna lie to you, there's also Smiley3 and Color3 
but they wouldn't fit on the slide. <laughs> um, we are using a gateway API ingress controller to mediate access between the GUI and the cluster. For my machine, this will be Envoy Gateway. For Mike's machine, For mine, it will be the I'm... Istio ingress gateway. Yeah. Um, part of the point is that it doesn't really matter. Also, we have a mesh running. Again, I will be running Linkerd, like sane people worldwide, and Mike will be running. <laughs> and I will be using <laughs> Istio for people who need that capability. That who are also sane, let's be clear. <laughs> yes. Um, and again, part of the point here is, with one exception, it's exactly the same. It does not matter which of the two you're choosing if the things that you're doing are you know, the things that we're doing here in this workshop. And Let's get I guess now we get to see how kind the demo gods are going to be to us. Um, yeah, right. why, don't you, uh, why don't you go ahead and get started? Yeah. I'm going to give you some time to get stuff up and running. I'll, uh, so yeah, um, going as well. we're going to walk through a demo of configuring service mesh uh, with um, yeah, API. So first up, we're going to start by install. I have a cluster running. I spun that up just before we got started. Uh, we're going to start Likewise. by installing the service mesh and Gateway API CRDs, and then doing any additional setup uh, our particular implementations need. Uh, finally, we'll create a namespace and set it up uh, for mesh enrollment and install our application and get going. I think that what I'm going to do here is just go ahead and do this installation on this machine yep. while we're watching it on your machine. Because the initial steps of this are basically the same. It's just going through and installing the CRDs and things like that. It'll look exactly the same on mine as on Mike's. So Mike, you can explain what you're doing. Absolutely. And then when we, get into, yep. yeah, mm -hmm. when we get into things where we want to actually show that both infrastructures are working, then we'll swap. Yeah. So uh, my cluster's there. Great. Um, I'm going to start by installing the Gateway API CRDs. So I'm installing the 1.1.1 experimental channel. Uh, there's a note here uh, about, um, if you want to explain a little bit about the Linkerd, I actually already touched on that in the, in the beginning, about uh, yeah. 1.2.0 uh, gateway G with gRPC root. Um, that is hopefully going to be um, resolved in the near future, but uh, for now we're on a slightly not uh, <laughs> Slightly not the, the <laughs> Slightly not one. latest, just barely not yeah. latest. It also occurs to me, I actually do need to show the Linkerd setup here, because okay. that part does look. But go ahead, okay, yeah. get, get yeah. Istio but, going but first. Yeah, Istio works with both the gRPC root uh, v1 alpha 2, as well as uh, the v1 uh, yeah. CRD. So. Yeah. There's one of the things that happens in Gateway API is that Gateway API does not have beta resources. We do alpha, and then we go straight to the GA things. And at the point where a resource goes GA, we tend to remove the alpha resource because it lessens the burden on the gateway, of, gateway API maintainers, really is what it comes down to. Um, but it makes life a little bit interesting when you have implementations that are using older versions of gateway API to deal with long-term support issues and the v1 alpha 2 resource goes away. So that's the situation Linkerd is in. So I've got STOCT hell here. I'm using the minimal profile uh, to skip installing the default ingress gateway. Uh, if you're looking to do this with Istio Ambient, it would be profile equals ambient. So very similar. Uh, I, I, did did not, not, I did not know that. Uh, now I'll go try uh, it. <laughs> I did not have quite enough time to get it entirely working with ambient. Uh, it just went GA uh, last week. So uh, 1.24 in Istio. Uh, I thought it went GA this week. Was that, that was last week. Was okay. Last week. I, so I, I've I learned two, two things about Istio <laughs> Mike actually was the release manager for Windows 24. So yep. kudos to Mike. So Istio core is installed. Um, we're waiting for the Istio <laughs> deployment to spin up. Should only take a few seconds. There we go. And Istio is ready to go on the cluster now. And I'll pass it over to Flynn to All right. show how the Linkerd setup is going to go. So. Yeah, can we go ahead and swap video? Yeah. All right. Oh, You're my not, laptop yeah, is not yeah, mirroring. Not your desktop, though. When I don't want it to mirror, it mirrors. When I do want it to mirror, it doesn't mirror. So, one moment with my apologies here. All right. So first off, you can ignore that the faces thing is going on. Um, this is the 
Yeah. <laughs> this is the same text that you saw go past with Mike, where this bit we go through and install the gateway API CRDs. This bit I went ahead and downloaded Linkerd. Uh, all right, I lied. I already had the right version of Linkerd installed. <laughs> it just verified it. Linkerd check dash dash pre is let's make sure this cluster can run Linkerd. The answer is it can. Linkerd install. I have to specifically tell Linkerd here, when you install the CRDs, please don't mess with any of the gateway API CRDs that are already there. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I am going to install Linkerd's control plane itself. And then we will go through and let it come up and be running. Now, one of the things that's slightly annoying about this demo as a Linkerd person mm -hmm. is that uh, we do use a separate ingress controller, so I'll be installing Envoy Gateway as well. Those of you who are following through this with Linkerd will be doing the same. Um, and for Istio, uh, you're just using Istio's Gateway API implementation to spin up its own ingress. Right. And it's under the hood, I feel confident that Istio is doing exactly the same thing, but you don't have to watch it. <laughs> So there's Linkerd running. That's the control plane going. And this bit is for Envoy Gateway. We're going to create a namespace for Envoy Gateway. And then we're going to tell Envoy Gateway, we're going to tell Linkerd, rather, to go ahead and make this gateway part of the mesh. And while we're at it, we're going to tell it that we're going to use native Kubernetes sidecars. Um, the native sidecar thing is kind of interesting, actually. Yeah. Envoy Gateway, when it starts, Envoy Gateway goes and creates some certificates that are used internally for Envoy Gateway. And it does this with a Kubernetes job. If any of you have worked with sidecar stuff before, you may realize that jobs are a little bit problematic, because the job can finish, but the sidecar keeps running before new native sidecars came around. And this made life really annoying, because as long as the sidecar was running, the job would never terminate. But native sidecars fixes that. So you, that's why we use it for Envoy Gateway. And the Envoy Gateway is already ready. Um, I don't remember if you did this bit on your side or not mm -hmm. with the gateway class and the gateway itself. Yep, that's what I have on my screen now. OK, then this will be a great, because way, it's to, great place to it's, switch it's over. It's a little less finicky uh, to deal with, but yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so, the default gateway class there for Envoy Gateway, the default gateway itself, I will put those in, and then make sure that Envoy Gateway is ready, and off we go. And if you can switch back to me for a moment. Yep. I'll be doing the exact, exact same, thing, same thing, just with uh, the Istio Gateway class. So right. you look at the gateway, kubectl apply. Um, you'll see basic gateway class Istio here. Uh, we're creating a listener on port 80 and allowing routes to attach from any namespace. Uh, and our gateway is named ingress. So these are gateway API CRDs. We just have to make sure that it's clear which implementation should be responsible for reconciling them. And that's what the gateway class name is for. Yes. Very important note. This demo is set up to use a gateway named ingress. If you are playing with this and you decide to edit the game of the gateway to be something you like better than ingress, you will also have to edit all the routes to make sure that they match, or things will get badly confused. Yep. So uh, my ingress is up and running. My uh, ingress so, is up and running. All right, it's an IP address locally. Um, there's a note later on, but uh, depending on the implementation that you're using, if you're using, say, like Docker for Mac or something like that, uh, you may have to address it as local host instead of the right. actual IP. Um, if you're doing this on a Linux box, chances are really good that that IP address that it says the ingress is running at is where you will go to find the ingress. If you're doing it on a Macintosh, and I've seen a, an amazing number of Macintoshes here, especially hanging out with the Gateway API really? crowd, it's yeah. kind of fascinating. Um, if you're doing it with a Macintosh and you're using Docker for Mac, you will have to set up some port forwarding stuff and things like that. I think you're using Docker for Mac and I'm yep. using OrbStack, yep. and so it's a little bit you know, I get to go to the IP address too, but Different it's, implementations, it's but the same yeah, thing. It's, yeah. It all works the same under the hood mostly. Yep. Um, yeah, so we're going to install that Faces app that Flynn was showing us as the example that we're going to walk through. So we're going to create a namespace for it first. 
and then set it up for mesh enrollment. So for Istio, what this looks like is we're gonna add a label to the faces namespace for sidecars to be injected. Uh, ambient mode uses a similar mechanism, just a different label, uh, to enroll namespace into the mesh. Why does ambient use a different label? Uh, because you don't want sidecars if you're running ambient. Is it meaningful to run ambient and then have some of your namespaces use sidecars? That sounds like a snarky it, question, no, but it's it, actually no, a real it's question. Actually, it, <laughs> it's very much a meaningful thing that we know Istio users who are using sidecars today are going to want to do. Okay. So that's so not that's something why. that works cleanly today, but it is absolutely on the roadmap for Ambient to make sure that we're able to support and migrate those users. Well, I apologize for asking you something that ended up being <laughs> snarkier than I no, thought. No, no, <laughs> not, not at all. No, it, it's a valid use case uh, that we're aware of and are planning yeah. to support. And it also kind of makes sense that yeah. you would have different annotations for that as well. Yeah. So yeah. All right. So uh, our uh, namespace is labeled now, and now we're going to Helm install the Faces application. Um, and while he's doing that, if you can switch back to me for a moment. Um, so I have already created the namespace here, where Istio uses a label, Linkerd uses an annotation. We have occasionally almost come to blows over this. <laughs> um, so specifically, I'm sitting here telling Linkerd, hey, every pod that shows up in the faces namespace, I want you to go ahead and bring it into the mesh. And while his is installing faces, I will install faces. The astute readers in the classroom will note that we both ran exactly the same Helm command. Um, anybody who's curious about why we're using a faces RC, uh, Faces 2.0.0 is not GA yet because I haven't made sure it works on my Raspberry Pis with blinking lights. Um, uh, you want to switch back to me for a second? Yeah. Yep. So uh, I've got the application installed now, and hopefully we should be able to go see the Faces GUI in the browser at either the IP address there or localhost, depending on your setup. Hopefully. It's not there. And if you could flip back to me. Um, I, I wanted to just show everybody that this is not because Istio is awful. Um, it, doesn't work. It, is awful. it doesn't work on the Linkerd setup either. And the reason is that, whoa. Normally I do this. Yeah. So, yeah, that didn't work. So we have our application, but and we have our running English control. And we have our running English control, but we haven't connected the two yet. So we need to tell our gateway controller how to direct traffic to the GUI. And to do that, we need to create an HTTP route. So what that's going to do is allow any HTTP request with a path starting with slash GUI to be directed to the Faces GUI service. And that makes sure that your web browser can reach it so that it actually downloads the bundle of HTML and JavaScript that you need to be able to see this. So this is what an HTTP route looks like. Actually, we can walk through that one because we have a little ah, bit. Of, we oh. have some time. Okay, we'll walk nope. through it one. <laughs> um, yeah, no looking at the HTTP route. We'll, we'll route. show a few more of those <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So um, that created the route on the browser, and it's there now. We're able to see. We're able to get to the GUI and get the HTTP. Or, sorry, get the HTML. But wow. this GUI is. The HTML JavaScript is served to your browser. It's running in the browser. That application needs to reach back into the cluster now. Right. You're going to flip to back to me for a moment. The service. All right. So I have the, uh, the HTTP route up. Um, this is where I kind of wish I had a laser pointer. So just walking through this a little bit, uh, the API version, the kind, the metadata is just kind of normal Kubernetes kind of stuff, right? The first interesting thing in the spec is the parent refs section, which basically is telling the thing managing all of this stuff about where we expect requests that match this route to show up. So in this case, we're saying this is a route that is supposed to be applied to traffic that shows up at the gateway named Ingress, and that gateway is in the default namespace. We are not going to talk very much about namespace crossing in this one. If you look at the gateway YAML that we applied, there's a chunk in there that literally says all namespaces are allowed. 
That is important for this demo. It's also almost certainly not the thing that you want if you're running in production. Something to be aware of. In this case, we're taking advantage of it by having our gateway in the, the default namespace, and then we're putting all the routes in faces because, well, you know, I mean, that's not an unreasonable thing to do. Um, is that my laptop going to sleep? Fascinating. Okay. Working down from there, we have a single rule in this route that's set up to match anything with a path prefix of slash GUI slash. Um, whether to include the trailing slash is a matter of religion, so, you know, we'll just leave that aside. Any traffic, any request, rather, that matches that path, so anything where the path starts with slash GUI slash, will get handed off to the backend refs if there's more than one backend ref, it'll get split among them, but there's only one here. The one backend ref is the faces GUI service on port 80. Since we didn't specify a namespace, that has to be in the same namespace as this HTTP route. Um, and when we go through, if you look very carefully at the indentation, you'll realize that matches, backend refs, and filters are all at the same level. They mm. all are part of the same rule. So anything that matches that rule will also get passed through this filter, and the purpose of that filter is to rewrite the part of the path that matched in the match clause with a slash. And the reason for that is that the microservice that's running to serve the GUI does not expect to see slash GUI in the path. It expects to be at the root. So that's a common pattern for applications, <laughs> is your application right. often may get exposed publicly someplace that is not directly relevant to your internal yeah. concerns of how that should be routed and your API or whatever you're building. Yeah, exactly. So it is um, kind of common to see five lines of filters in there to do that yeah. rewrite. So I shall also install this one. And when I come over here, I too get grimacing faces on purple backgrounds. Excellent. Um, actually, let me just keep on going for a second. And then, yeah, yeah. so as we mentioned before, if you remember the demo architecture, the GUI is talking to the face workload, which talks to the smiling and color workloads. So these grimacing faces on purple backgrounds are what the GUI does when it can't talk to the face surface at all. So we will fix that by doing yet another HTTP route, which will look strikingly similar to the first one we did um, with the notable exception that, uh, okay, apparently I spelled out that this is a gateway instead of letting it be defaulted in the parent refs. That's, yeah. I forgot I did that. Sorry. Um, it's an implicit default. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you don't add those fields, it's just implicitly uh, kind gateway. Right. Of group, um, uh, gateway. Yeah, we're changing the path prefix because we want it to route things to slash face, or sorry, requests where the path matches slash face as a prefix because that's what the GUI spits over when, you, when, it's making it, when it is making its request. Um, I don't know why I put the filters next instead of putting the backend refs next. I should have been consistent there. No. But the point here is the backend refs, where what we said earlier was if it matches slash GUI slash, we'll take it over to the GUI service. And in this case, we're saying if it matches slash face, we'll take it to the face service instead. We do the same rewriting for exactly the same reason Mike just mentioned. And if we install this, suddenly things are different now. And uh, I think you can flip back yep. to him so we can get to the same place. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing. Same route that we're applying here. I'm gonna apply it and flip back. And it's working for me too now. Excellent. And that's literally the exact same route definition. No, nothing changed at all between Linkerd and Istio for that. Mm -hmm. The resource we were applying. Uh, this is also making me realize that I got some of this mixed up because we actually are doing the version that has everything working correctly up front. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, sorry about that. <laughs> this, this is the way this demo is supposed to go. I misspoke at the beginning when we were looking at the screenshot, so it's on me, sorry. It's a flexible application that is often used to demonstrate yeah. other scenarios as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I want to know. Ah. Let's 
go back into slideshow mode for a second. Gateway API for mesh. mesh. Why, yes. So yeah, um, what can API, Gateway API do in the mesh? Um, the, <laughs> I don't know, moral equivalent, uh, but what we're doing with Gateway API here is unconditionally routing traffic within the mesh. So that's how you start simply. Uh, with ingress traffic, if you remember seeing the parent ref where uh, on the previous slide, Flynn had actually spelled out uh, the kind gateway that was targeting as well as the name of ingress. Uh, for mesh traffic, we can use a parent ref to attach our HTTP route, uh, uh, sorry. For ingress traffic, we use it to attach our HTTP route to the gateway. And for mesh traffic, we'll use that same parent ref, but we'll explicitly point it to a service instead. Actually, you have some slides that talk about this. Oh, do I? <laughs> All right. Mike's getting so excited by the demo. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm into the demo, yeah. So uh, yeah, Gateway API and Gamma. Um, the Gamma initiative uh, is part of Gateway API. It started in 2022 to sort out how to use Gateway API for various service mesh implementations. Uh, a handful of us had interacted previously through other attempts at doing some sort <laughs> of common mesh interface. Um, and uh, when we saw the kind of explosive growth of Gateway API, it made a lot of sense for us to all come to this project and collaborate together through this. That really had buy-in and excitement from so many implementations. Ultimately, the thing that drove some of this was, if you think about it, HTTP requests are HTTP requests. If, you're ha if you have a mechanism for describing an HTTP route that happens north-south from out of the cluster to into the cluster, you probably ought to be able to use that mechanism to talk about yeah. routing HTTP traffic east-west as well. well. I mean, obviously there are some places where it doesn't work flawlessly, but, or sorry, there's some places where that model breaks down a little bit and you want to do slightly different things. There are some places where the mesh won't do exactly the same thing, like a mesh doing cores is probably a strange concept, but the same routing concept makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Linkerd has been using Gateway API for mesh traffic since 2.13, so I think that's more than... It's a little while. Yeah, it's a little while yeah. now. Uh, and Istio has been using Gateway API for ingress for an extremely long time, <laughs> and uh, mesh traffic for close to the same amount of time that Linkerd has been using it. So many releases by this point. I think, I might be misremembering, I feel like Linkerd and Istio both ended up shipping it like right about the same time. Pretty, it was pretty Like close, the yeah. same month, you yeah. know, something like that. Yeah. So Gateway API and Gamma. Uh, mesh traffic routing is configured with the Gateway API HTTP route and gRPC route resources. Uh, we're going to use a parent ref to associate the HTTP route with the service you want to affect, and then using backend refs to describe where you want that traffic to go. Please note we said service there not gateway yeah. or other funky thing. And that was what I was jumping ahead to yeah. uh, with kind of the differentiation between uh, if you do not specify a kind for your parent ref, it is implicitly assumes a gateway target. Right. So for mesh work purposes, you're going to have kind service uh, to make group, sure. so Kind group service, empty, group, group empty, empty string. string. <laughs> uh, the, the Kubernetes core the API group. group is a little funky. It is an explicit empty string. <laughs> yeah. I think with Linkerd it works to say group core as well. Yeah. But well, that's a Linkerdism. So we're I don't gonna think stick that's, to the, yeah, that's not the right the right. We're gonna way. stick to the parts that are uh, compatible that are standard. across the, <laughs> the yeah. standard, yes. Uh, and for mesh, there's many things that you can't currently do that are functionality that people have come to expect from service meshes, but we're actively working on making all of this better quickly. Uh, this slide, I was just editing it last night. And That's why I'm reading it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun. So uh, last time, this was talking about timeouts being something new. Timeouts have been around now uh, for a couple of releases. So uh, it's not worth including as a actively working on coming soon thing. I think they actually graduated to standard in 1.2. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so that's a standard part of For HTTP API. route. Yes. Yes. Uh, get, get into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Uh, a recent gap uh, that was also in 1.2 is introducing the concept of retries on HTTP root. This is only experimental, and it just landed in the experimental channel in Gateway API 1.2, uh, so it's only been around for a couple weeks. So I was going to say, I don't think anybody's implemented it yet, right? But I think, we, I think Envoy Gateway might have, because... Huh. Yeah. Okay. So, but in any case, um, 
we're, it's oh, definitely yeah. start looking have. for downstream implementation soon. Uh, it's work that is now possible because it's included in the spec. So right. the path of uh, some functionality like this is introduced as experimental. We have a couple of implementations start supporting it. We write conformance tests for it. And after it's stuck around and matured and we're sure that this is what we want, then it gets promoted to the standard channel of Gateway API. And that's kind of the progression that all of this functionality goes through. Or um, we decide that it's not what we want and yeah. we drop it from the experimental channel. Yeah. And um, that's the purpose of why experimental right. exists, yeah. is to allow us to try these things before committing to it as a permanent stable API. Yep. So yeah, there's, there's work in progress to bring timeouts and retries to gRPC root two. Uh, I think hopefully both of these are things that are gonna be worked on during the 1.3 timeframe. F fingers crossed on that. We're, we're currently uh, doing the planning cycle for that, so uh, look for the Gateway API discussions uh, on the <laughs> GitHub repo if you uh, want to contribute to helping decide what we're going to prioritize for that next release. Um, but do it quickly if you yeah. want to have any say on what we prioritize in 1.3, because I think that closes Tomorrow? In like two weeks? No, no I, think, I, think was, I think it was in our week or so. I don't remember. Yeah. Soon, though. <laughs> Can you tell that we've both been spending all our time recently getting ready for KubeCon instead of reading all the <laughs> gateway enhancement proposals? <laughs> yeah. Uh, rate limiting policy, it's a bit trickier. It's something that has more divergence between implementations. <laughs> uh, it is also on our radar, though. So yeah. a few implementations have started experimenting with it already. And hopefully that's one of the things that will, again, as I mentioned earlier, kind of have that convergence of we get a few early experiments and then start to define what that spec might look like. Yeah. Um, Identity-based Auth-Z policy is another core service mesh functionality. Uh, we hope to expand our scope to eventually include it. Right now we know that Auth-Z policy is possible to implement within each mesh. So yes. it's a slightly longer tail. Uh, we're trying to solve the kind of auth and ingress problem first because that's something that has really been a pain point for adopting Gateway API broadly and making sure that we can get those trusted users with their val validated identity through the ingress and into uh, the mesh uh, services. Right. Auth is hard. All right. Uh, I think we can go back to the demo. To yeah, yeah. So yeah, let, let's walk through this. Um, we're going to take a look at basically uh, the simple example of just uh, routing all of the traffic intended for the service to itself. Um, so we have parent refs here with kind service, the empty string group, and it's going to port email to the service. So that's where we're trying to intercept traffic from, and that's what we're doing with the parent ref there. But it's not sending it anywhere different first. I don't even think we actually apply that one. Yeah. That's, uh, that's just the demonstration of the simplest possible yep. thing we could do. Yeah. So this is what we're going to do now is actually redirect that traffic. So you saw the Smiley2 service uh, in the beginning uh, when we were talking about the architecture of this demo. Uh, it's going to return a different smiley face. It's it going to return hard a hard-eyed hard smiley face. So when we apply this, all the traffic that's currently going to the smiley service will be redirected. So I'm going to apply that and then jump back over to my app, and everything's going to the hard eyes. And you can flip over here now. This is the same route. You can see it on screen there. And there you go. It works in both implementations. Which is one of those things that always sounds like it's kind of silly to say, right? Oh, we both did the same thing. And the same thing happened. Isn't that great? <laughs> well, it kind of is great, because Linkerd and Istio are very, very different under the hood. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, the so next thing. Custom Rust-based proxy that you've built yeah. yourselves were building on top of Envoy, or? Slight difference. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we can actually do the same thing for gRPC as well here. So when we talked about the demo architecture, face talks to Smiley using HTTP, but it talks to color using gRPC. So I can take this gRPC route, and if you look back a little bit, this route is just taking everything to the Smiley service and tossing it over to Smiley2. A request that is presented 
a request that is directed to the service whose name is Smiley is instead going to be turned and sent to the service name Smiley2. Um, this is exactly the same thing. We changed this to gRPC route. We changed this to talk about the color service instead of the Smiley service. And we changed this to color2 instead of Smiley2. And when I install that, you will see all of the colors change to green. And now we can flip back and observe. Uh, the empty string group, the default group for a backend ref is gateway.networking.cates.io. There is no service resource within that API group. The service resource exists in the core Kubernetes API group, and the official name of the core Kubernetes API group is the empty string. <laughs> Talk to the Kubernetes maintainers if you think that's silly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there we go. I was pleasantly surprised the first time I ran through this because Flynn actually wrote this uh, GPC <laughs> stuff. And I was fingers crossed, I hope this works on Istio. And it, it did. It just, the first time I ran through it, I didn't have to change anything, tweak anything. It, it just worked. So that's. Which is, <laughs> he sent me a Slack message going, it worked. <laughs> this is great. So yeah, this is exactly the kind of experience that we want all Gateway API users to have is once you understand and learn the spec, no matter what implementation you're working with, if you change jobs, if you change meshes, if you change ingresses for any reason. If you uh, migrate from Istio to Linkerd. If you have to work with both of them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you learn this Which, one API. For the record, working with both of them is way more common than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in some of these larger organizations, yes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, in practice it's kind of unconditional routing where you permanently redirect something. It's not always a great idea to kind of keep it in that state. Um, That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. So suppose um, we send all the Smiley traffic to Smiley2, only to find out Smiley2 is broken. The, the, I mean, that never happens in practice. No. You would never deploy a service that turns out to be broken, right? At, at least in that situation, we can just delete that route and everything goes back. Right. Or we can edit the route to redirect Revert back the to route itself. To whatever it was yep. beforehand. And that's, yeah, assuming we noticed it was broken right away. If we didn't, a lot of people would be unhappy. They'd be tweeting about it or TikToking yeah. about it or whatever we're doing now. <laughs> we're not talking about the observability part of service mesh. Service meshes are supposed to be adding security, reliability, and observability. We're not talking about the observability part because Gateway API doesn't really deal with observability. And you still end up with very, very different observability things. Yeah. But yeah, observability is important. You really need to know if somebody has dumped a route in that is routing to a broken service, for example. Yeah. So, so in any case, we want a, a different pattern of, instead of just 100% shifting everything over, we want to test it and make sure it's working first. Um, ideally, before we shut down and get rid of that original service. So to do that, uh, the concept is called canaries. Um, and what we're doing with that is assigning just a little bit of incoming traffic to a new workload. And if things go well, if that canary is successful, you can start shifting more and more of it incrementally over until you do have that 100%. And that's called progressive delivery is kind of the concept for that. So to demonstrate this with Gateway API, we're going to first reset back to our known good state with uh, the blue backgrounds and the smileys. So we're deleting uh, the couple of routes that we've added. And to be honest about this, I decided to throw in the reset step because when I did it without the reset step, I got confused <laughs> trying to remember what the state of the world was. Yep. Yeah. So uh, this is the new canary route that we're applying. So the difference here, if you look closely at the backend refs, uh, we've added a new wait field. Well, we've so, added a second backend ref too. Oh yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's also important, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, how it knows to split between them is by that weight field of knowing how much traffic to assign to each one. These numbers don't have to add up to 100. It just tends to make a little bit more sense when they do. Um, a little easier to read. But yeah, that. it'll do the percentage weighting. So if you have three to one or something like that, it'll be the same as 75, 25. Yeah. But and if you leave out the weight entirely, it'll do a, a, an equal I weight, think, equal yes. split between all your backend refs. Yes. So. We're back to our known good state here. And when we apply this root, we should start seeing just a handful. There's a the, couple, if you look closely, of the hard-eyed ones. 
the, the exercise of figuring out how many cells should be showing a hard-eyed smiley at 10% is left as an exercise for the reader. Um, but uh, that looks about right to me. <laughs> so once we see a couple that are successful, we're going to change the fraction of traffic being diverted uh, just by changing the weights in the HTTP route. Normally, you would not go from 10% to 50% in one step, let's be clear. Um, there are but we only have half an hour left. And <laughs> integrations with telemetry that you can do to right. go check out make these changes in a much more CD. incremental, automated right. way. But we're just going to bump it up uh, to 50-50 because it looks good enough to start right now. Right. And so, to our earlier point, you could do this by just deleting the weights entirely. But if you're doing percentage-based weighting, it feels more natural to edit the value instead of just deleting it. And, and we're going to keep going with we're it. We're going to keep going, yeah. of course. So, we know that we want to keep this stick, uh, have this route stick around for a little bit. So at 50-50, you start seeing a lot more hard eyes. Looking good. And finally, we'll go back to a kind of unconditional route where we set one weight to zero and the other to 100. We could also just delete the original smiley back in ref, but right. it's two different ways to do the same thing. Part of the point here is to recognize that we mentioned that the weights don't have to add up to 100, and that is true. But a weight of zero always means don't give any traffic to this backend ref. And especially if you're doing things with like kube control patch, it can be a lot easier to set the value than it is to delete the whole stanza. Yep. Um, how about flip over here for yeah. a second? So we, yeah, we've got hard eyes there. So I'm going to do this a lot quicker than Mike just did. But I just applied the 10% weight. So we can see that I'm getting a few smileys up there. And there's applying the 50% weight. And there's the 100% weight. So once again, we've done the same thing with two wildly different infrastructures and gotten the same results, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, we're going to get rid of that original. Yeah, problem. we're going <laughs> to prove the smiley workload is doing nothing. So there you go. I've scaled it down to zero replicas. And my application is still working, because there's no traffic going to that original smiley workload anymore. Um, Do you want to keep driving or switch back to uh, Yeah, let me, I'll drive this bit for a second. Right, yeah. um, we mentioned earlier that from the operational point of view, this is not a good place to be. Because if you come back to this six weeks later, you will have forgotten that that route is doing unconditional stuff. So if it's six weeks later, and something is going wrong with the application, and you're seeing cursing smileys instead of hard-eyed smileys or something like that, the on-call engineer goes through and says, oh, hey, I should look at the logs for the face workload. And they look at that, and they say, oh, hey, look at this. The face workload is going to talk to HTTP colon slash slash smiley. That's great. I'll go look at the smiley workload. Then they get the logs for the smiley workload, and they find that there are no pods. Maybe they weren't even around when this route got installed. Maybe they don't know what's going on. Maybe they were the ones who installed it, but then they forgot it. This never happens to me. Um, so yeah, it's operationally, this sort of unconditional routing is not a good idea. So the right way to deal with this would be, after we scale Smiley to zero, the right way to do it would be to redeploy the Smiley workload with you know, the version that is returning the hard-eyed Smileys bring it back up, and then delete the route. Because that way, you're not relying on this sort of unconditional routing doing weird things. Um, for this particular workshop, we're just going to scale the smiley workshop back up, or smiley workload back up, oh yeah, um, and then delete the HTTP route so that we can come back to grinning smileys. Um, now we're going to run through the same thing. We're going to run through the same thing with color. Do you want to? Uh, let's go yep. back over to yours so that you can show I that when you did the same thing. I did, oh, oh I, you've already yeah, done it. I okay, already great. did. I just skipped ahead. Yeah, We're, excellent. Want to make sure that we get through all of this. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's, oh. always, it's always funny. You hear, oh, it's a ninety-minute workshop. We've got all the time in the world. No, we really <laughs> don't. <laughs> so yeah, we can canary gRPC services too. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we're using gRPC for the color workload. So we're going to look at uh, a gRPC route with the same kind of backends, uh, color and color two. And we're starting a little bit more aggressively with a weight of 25 and 75. So where I'm at now is just smileys with the blue background. And when I apply this route, 
you'll start to see a few green cells. And we can, again, bump it up to 50-50. Start to see a few more. The random numbers get really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that looked like more than 50-50, whatever. Yep. All right, so right now we're kind of sitting uh, in the middle with it, 50-50 uh, split. So um, we'll move ahead to a little bit to talk about dynamic routing. So this is what we kind of covered earlier of Gateway API lets you make routing decisions based on various information in the request itself. So the path, the headers, the query parameters. Uh, in the previous example, we were just doing a canary based on what service was being called. Um, but we can actually make that much more granular. We can, for HTTP, we can route on the path, we can route on the headers, uh, gRPC, we can route on the method, which is a common way to do that. So, uh, and on our demo example, all the cells on the edge actually have a different HTTP path for them. So, and a different gRPC method while we're at it. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So we're gonna take a look at what it would look like to actually write a rule that matches on a path of slash edge. Let me flip back over here yep. to catch up with you so that we don't have to walk, get too far out of sync here. Yep. So there's my 25% smiley, or colors, <laughs> and there's my 50% colors. So half green, half blue, give or take, random numbers are a thing. Um, yeah, we'll just swap here for a second. Yeah, yeah, keep going. So here we're gonna do a, really an A-B test of the smileys, where anything, if you look at the matches there, anything where the path looks like slash edge will get sent over to smiley two, so we should get hard-eyed smileys. I have to really rename these as hearts and things like that. <laughs> and uh, anything that doesn't match, because again, if you look carefully at the indentation, this is a single match, or single rule, I should be saying. Yep. So if it matches slash ed slash, we go to the backend ref for this rule, and if it doesn't, we'll go to this one, which we don't specify a match, so that's basically anything else. More specific things win in Gateway API. If you have two things that are exactly the same specificity, we can go and talk about conflict resolution, but more specific things always win. So when I apply this, all of the cells around the edge will get hard-eyed smileys, and the ones in the middle stick with grinning smileys. And let's flip back so that we can show that yep. with ECO as well. We're doing the same thing, applying the same thing, and again, around the edge. So yeah, this is a very common need for if you're doing anything like redirecting traffic to one, uh, like say like splitting up a monolith into a microservice is kind of a common example of this. You yeah. have this one large service that has many different paths that it's serving on. And if you're breaking on one of those off into a microservice, you can write an HTTP route to redirect traffic to that different backend only when it matches that particular path. So it's a really common pattern for being able to decompose these large applications as you're making them more cloud native. Yep. All right. <clears throat> now we're to combine that with a canary and get really <laughs> wild and crazy. Yep. So yeah, you, you can use these rules together. Um, so for this one, uh, for the edge, we're gonna do a 50-50 weight between Smiley 2 and Smiley 3. We're, smiley, rolling out. we're running out of Smiley. So smiley 3 is supposed to roll, return Smiley's with rolling eyes, just yep. for the record. Yep, so we're rolling out, say, a new version of uh, that microservice that we're trying right. to deploy. And so, when we do that, so let's do this. And shit, something went wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, you get. I got some of them. You get some with rolling eyes, yeah. and you get some that are cursing because. So we, we had a bad deploy. Yeah, this is a problem. Yeah. Our developer on Smiley 3 was clearly asleep at the wheel. Yep. Um, so what do we do here? We need a rollback. Um, half time Smiley is not returning the face with the rolling eyes that we expect, it says returning this cursing face. Um, which is not what we expect. So to roll back, we'll just apply, reapply the previous HTTP route, um, so we get the hard-eyed smileys uh, back on the edge cells. If you're doing a like configuration as code thing, maybe you push a git revert to roll back, and every and your CI system rolls this out for you automatically. So the specific way that you apply the route doesn't really matter to us. Yep. So there and we now go. We're back. I applied it, and we're back to this known good state. 
all without doing anything with like restarting the pods or doing an entire new deployment. We're just shifting the traffic. Yep. Uh, swap yeah, let's swap back to me for a moment. Same thing. There's my bit where I've added a backend ref for Smiley 3 into my list on the edge. I will apply that. And once again, it's not just Istio's problem here. Mine is doing exactly the same thing. And I will respond exactly the same way by getting rid of Smiley 3 and going back to just Smiley 2. Um, as Mike points out, one of the really important things here is you don't have to go wake up your application developers at 8 p.m. on a Friday night. You can just fix it in the mesh and be done with it, at least until Monday morning. We can also be much more drastic about this and just delete the edge routing entirely so that now we're back to having all grinning faces everywhere. Um, we can do the same thing with gRPC services. I'm going to go very quickly through this. The big difference is that we are doing a match on the method rather than the path. And if I apply this, then, oh wait, something is interesting. We have all green at the edges, but we still have a mix of green and blue in the center. Um, the reason that we're seeing this, rather than calling out to the audience and wait for that since we're down to 18 minutes and 46 seconds, um, do you remember that we still have a gRPC route in play right now? What's happening here is, like I said, in Gateway API, more specific things win. So the gRPC route that specifies a match on the gRPC service and method is more specific than the one that just says any traffic to this particular Kubernetes service gets rerouted. So out on the edge, our route for edge routing takes effect. And where in the center it doesn't match, it falls back to the previous gRPC route which is doing a canary between green and blue. This is one of the complex things about Gateway API. There is a fair amount of tooling in play, a fair amount of tooling being written to try to make it easier to see the route table as you're going through and working with this to make this sort of thing easier to reason about. Um, I'm not gonna lie, when I first saw this in the demo, I actually thought it was a bug. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back and really you know, looked into it to yep. figure out what was going on. So I'm gonna delete the old canary, and when I delete the old canary, since I'm leaving the edge gRPC route in place, I should see all of the center cells turn blue and all of the edge cells, the edge cells stay green, which is what we get. That seems like, oh yeah, I'll mention this one before we flip back. Um, in every case when we do this, changing the route immediately has an effect. You don't have to restart pods. You don't have to go and put things to sleep. You don't have to do any craziness like that. You just change stuff in the routing layer, and it immediately happens. And uh, yeah, let's flip back for yep. get Istio caught up here. Or OK, get the demo on the Istio side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Let's, let's be a little <laughs> more fair there. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. So yeah, I, I've been running through, and the same kind of thing. Uh, all green cells on the edge with gRPC root. We have them still the old one in the middle because of the old route. So it's doing even the same uh, conflict resolution yeah. goal, which is really important for having that predictable behavior yeah. of we actually spend a lot of time in Gateway API deciding what these conflict resolution rules are so that you can have predictable behavior between different yeah. implementations. I guess one specific other thing to say about that is if you do have two things that are exactly the same, the oldest one wins. Yeah not the newest one wins. For and that's so that you can have a reliance for, on yeah. some kind of stability of if you had a thing working before and you do a new identical thing at the same level of specificity. It should work. It, the older one should yeah. work. It, it, stability is a good thing, right? <laughs> that's really yeah. what it comes down to. So yeah, um, the, you've seen this the whole time, but uh, there's an immediate effect. Um, yeah. You're adding a new route, you're deleting a route, and the mesh is going to immediately redirect this traffic. Um, it doesn't have to wait for a pod to come up or anything like that. And yeah, all of the stuff that we're doing with gRPC root and HTTP root is intended to be accessible to the application developer. So that's really kind of a critical difference with ingress, where you would have this monolithic ingress resource, and either 
everybody's allowed to write to it and people stomp on each other's stuff accidentally. Constantly. Or nobody's allowed to write to it and you have to go ask your cluster operator to please update my route. I need to do a new A-B test for my thing. And having this kind of control for the application developer makes it much faster to iterate like this and really gives them more control but in a safe way. As much as we all love submitting Jira tickets. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, we'll try to briefly go through A-B testing. So we've really gone through like splitting up a monolith into a microservice. Um, if you have a single service, sometimes you want to adjust the traffic uh, or, or adjust the back end that you're returning um, based on something like uh, headers or potentially a logged in user. Um, <laughs> logged in. <laughs> logged in is a, a, a bit of a strong term, but we're going to simulate this. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So we have, um, well, actually, so here's the AB route. Yes. Mike could talk about that one. And yeah. Yeah. So what we're doing here is we're looking for the X faces user header, um, which is a magic header which is being supplied by the GUI in this yep. particular case. Yep. And, and only if that value is heart. So only for the logged in heart user are we going to route to the Smiley2 backend ref. Everyone else is going to get Smiley. So this might be for um, a subset of users that you're assigning a like beta opt-in flag, yep. uh, something like that. So right now, I am back to this. And if you look up in the top of that, oh, yep. you'll see the user unknown yep. field. Yep. So, th so there's, yeah, there's nothing past there currently. Right. So I'm going to apply this route. Logged in is a very strong and term. We're just whatever value you type At first, in nothing happens. You know? um, because I'm not logged in. If I log in as heart, suddenly I start seeing all the heart eyes. Yep. Uh, you can flip over here for a second. I have already installed that HTTP route. So if I come up here and change from being logged in as Flynn to being logged in as heart, same thing happens. I now get heart eyed smileys. If I go back to Flynn, I get no heart eyed smileys. Also, you know, if at the point that we're doing this, one of the purposes of an A-B test is to get feedback from your users. If we decide that we, you know, really, really want everybody to have hard out smileys, as we've seen before, we can just do the unconditional route thing, and it works. I'm going to delete that, so we're back to the smiley, grinning smileys. For everyone, including the heart yeah. user. We can do exactly the same thing with gRPC. So... Um, I confess, I was a little uncertain about this when I tried it, as mm. to whether headers really worked out correctly in oh, gRPC. Yeah, yeah. Uh. The answer is, uh, in gRPC, they call them metadata, and sometimes, but it looks like a header to us, so it works. And once again, if we apply this bit, then we get dark blue cells at the center, but green at the edges. And that's only if you're logged in as the heart user. So right, I mean, but we should get all dark blue colors, not just in the center. But the reason is that is that that conflict resolution thing again. My rule here that has a, the header match is considered to be the same specificity as my edge match on the method. Mm. So mm. the older one wins, and I still get green out there yep. on the edges. Until, of course, yeah, so we've got that. That's what I just said. The older route wins. If I delete the older route, then I get blue everywhere. And over back here, yeah. so we can show the same thing. So, yep, I'm applying the same gRPC route. And I'm still logged in as heart, so I get it. If I go back to a different user, not getting them anymore. And conflict resolution works the same way. Deleting the edge color, it's back to light blue because I'm not logged in. If I log in as heart, everything's dark blue. Woo. So yeah, it, it's fun. This stuff, it's very similar for gRPC root and HTTP root. Um, yep. So that's one of the really powerful things about this API is that we really try to be consistent across the various aspects of it as much as we can yep. uh, so that it's very little that you're learning to do differently um, regardless of what kind of your needs are here. So at this point, a bit of a question for the audience. We have 10 minutes left in this slot. We can go 
and demo some stuff with timeouts. Or we can stop here, and uh, I think we have a couple of gotchas on the slides. Um, let's go and talk about gotchas a little bit, and yeah. then see if anybody has questions. And that, I think, sounds like a, a reasonable way to do that. Um, gotchas, okay. There are kind of only a couple of things here. Um, the, this is the really the most important, calling it a gotcha might be a little strong, but if you try something in Gateway API and it doesn't work, the most important place to start is always to start by looking at the statuses on your Gateway API resources. So if you install an HTTP route and the thing that you expect to happen does not happen, the first thing you should do is look at the status on the HTTP route because it will tell you things like, oh, your gateway controller accepted this, or it won't. And it will tell you things like, was your gateway controller able to resolve your backend refs into real services so it knows how to talk to them? Or it will tell you if it can't. This sort of thing ends up being critical for trying to debug any of these things. Um, you can absolutely check out the API specification you can also honestly just read over and go, hey, why is this thing saying ready false? And then do a little bit of Googling, and sometimes that's more practical than reading the spec first. Um, sorry, did we get, nah. oh, were you no. about to add something else? No, okay. no. Um, let's, uh, let's go on to the next one then. So yeah, I, I, the, the kubectl, um, looking at just the status, that's the, the kind of bare bones Kubernetes way. Uh, there's also a gateway cuddle uh, application that is, in development. Yeah, it's in development. Yeah, I it's think in development, it, but kind of the intent of that is to make some of these workflows of specific things with Gateway API more accessible. Yeah, I don't think Gateway Control actually does much status rendering yet. It, it's but it's that, one of the things it's, it's that's been talked about. As yeah, like it's starting plans. to, I think. Yeah. Um, there's another gotcha in here with... Oh, sorry. Go uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. um, particularly in the mesh where you're talking about services, if you try to have, if you try to use HTTP routes or gRPC routes to take traffic to foo, split it into traffic to bar and baz, and then take traffic to bar and split that, that will not work for traffic that goes to foo and then gets funneled to bar. It will work for traffic coming into bar. Um, this is one of the weirder things, but the reason this, the reason that this happens, one more, is that we make a big distinction between the place that you are trying to send the traffic, the front end of the service, and the workloads, you know, the actual endpoints that the service resolves to. Um, HTTP route or gRPC route, the routing decisions get, hap get made when something arrives at the front end of a service. So something is being directed to the cluster IP that belongs to the Kubernetes service resource. The routing decision happens exactly once, and then it goes straight to an endpoint. So if you try to stack them, there's no second chance for the routing to happen. And that's honestly This is not a good a thing. thing. <laughs> this is generally a good thing, yeah. It, it's Go ahead, guys, you saw with kind of the, the layering and the conflict resolution that if you yeah. just keep stacking things up, it can get, it could get inordinately complex. Yeah. So having this logic and this kind of rule limits the amount of complexity that's even possible there, which yeah. is not a bad it's, thing. Yeah. Um, and one more again yep. is what you're really setting up when you try to do that hierarchical thing is something that looks like that. This is not something that often gets people into trouble, but it is something where if it affects you, it's a very confusing the first time. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it in terms of, of the major gotchas here. Um, we talked about north-south, we talked about east-west. Um, Mike pointed out, if you're doing this for a new deployment, Gateway API is definitely something you should consider right now. Uh, Flagger and Argo both work. Yep. I'm pretty, yeah, Flagger and Argo both yeah, work absolutely. with the, the, basically, like Argo rollouts or Flagger can use Gateway API routes to go and control the waiting on their progressive delivery things, yep. and yes. Come help us build this. It's kind of cool. Um, also, if you look up in the source that we mentioned earlier, then you can go through and see the timeouts part for your, you know, on your own. 
Um, yeah. yeah. Any questions? Uh, actually, there's a microphone here somewhere. Yeah. Just call it out. We'll repeat it. Yeah. Or, Multi-cluster gets into, sorry, the question was basically about using gateway API for multi-cluster. How does this work with multi-cloud? Multi yes. Huh? Yeah, no, just how does this work with multi-cluster? Yeah. yeah. Um, the main trick here right now is that you can definitely use gateway API for multi-cluster, multi-cloud, stuff like that. You will be relying on your service mesh to protect the traffic between the clusters. Gateway API does not magically allow meshes to interoperate with each other. So it would be exceptionally difficult, I think, to have one cluster running Istio and one cl cluster running Linkerd and get them to talk to each other in any particularly safe <laughs> way. No, um, but, but yeah, if you have a multi-cluster Linkerd mesh or a multi-cluster Istio mesh. It works very well. There's one gotcha with that. And the one gotcha is that if you have I'll, I'll pick on Linkerd multi-cluster for a moment because I know it a lot better I'll, I'll than Istio. In, in um, yeah. You have cluster east, cluster west. You mirror a service from cluster west into cluster east. Um, with Linkerd's normal multi-cluster, you'll end up with a service called foo west in the east cluster. You could use an HTTP route to set up something where you've got one backend of the normal foo service in your east cluster and one backend of the service in your west cluster. It is very difficult to make failover work in that situation because making failover work in that situation almost always breaks progressive delivery. Um, Linkerd actually is coming out with a federated service idea that allows that to work a lot more smoothly um, by doing it below the level of HTTP routes. So you can use HTTP route to route around federated things and it's really cool and we'll talk about, actually there was a lightning talk about that earlier. Um, <laughs> But that's the major gotcha, is figuring out a really clean way to do multi-cluster failover with HTTP routes. It turns out to be really hard. Yeah. Does, that, does that answer the question? Yeah. And, and yeah, and I'm currently working on the Istio ambient multi-cluster design. So we're absolutely looking at like how to do this with gateway API route. We're looking at things like the MCS API with service imports and service exports. It's unclear if that's the implementation we're going to go with. but. Um, one of the things you want to be able to do is, ideally, you want to be able to shift traffic that has been cluster local and opt into sending it uh, across a multiple cluster implementation, yep. hopefully without the need to change your application code. Yep. So that's one of the things that you can do uh, with HTTP routes, potentially. Uh, I know that some implementations are already doing this. Uh, I've demoed that multiple uh, I think times. Google's like, uh, North-South Gateway implementation is using service import for this. So uh, uh, to yeah, it, it, they have a... Maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's something yeah. I've looked at. It's like a reference implementation. So yeah, like there are implementations doing uh, multi-cluster with gateway API, and it's definitely something that's on our mind that we're looking at as well. Um, the the, the multi-cluster implementation with gateway API does, does work currently as far as I know. Um, we are looking to be able to do more things with it and more granularly, specifically for Ambient, is the design that I'm looking at. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, question? Yeah. Didn't we put the. Okay, actually, before he gets off this slide, quick, everybody take a picture of the QR code because that will take you to the end user survey for Gateway API and we yes. at Gateway API desperately want that information. So yes. everybody take a picture of this. Come on, come on, hurry up. <laughs> um, uh, Mike's gonna find the, yep. actually, or I guess you could just add it to the slide. GitHub.com slash buoyant.io slash Gateway API workshop. that has everything you just saw on stage, and it even will let you 
easily switch between playing with Istio or playing with Linkerd? Yep. Uh, the slides are not here. Uh, we can slide, put the slides there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The slides will be linked. Uh, if you look at the like KubeCon schedule, those will oh, eventually you get added. Them? I never uh, they'll eventually them. get added there. Hey, did you up? Th they again? were not? Uh, OK. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I, it, I after, didn't, afterwards, yeah. they will be. <laughs> I, I never uploaded the slides. So <laughs> if Mike did, I think, I think kudos I did to Mike. Last time when we presented this, but not um, this time yet. So well, I, I will we'll, go put them there after this. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll, we'll also stick a PDF of the slides in the repo. So, All right. Well, I think but, that we're I think yeah. we're out of time now. But thank you so much, everyone who, who thank attended. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, much appreciated. appreciated.